A deadly crash highlighting a major flaw in Kansas transportation safety, a flaw that could endanger your life. Plus, questions about COVID death rates, a federal grant, and Wichita ethics. But first, accusations of politicians getting in the way of your voting rights here in Kansas. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. We begin today with the accusation there are those in Kansas who are keeping some of you from voting. And it may not be who you think. That's just part of what former Sedgwick County Elections Commissioner Tabitha Lehman had to say in a sit down interview with the ACLU. Lehman, a Republican, sat down for a nearly hour long conversation with the ACLU, covering everything from voter suppression to fraud and the role of voter ID laws in securing your vote. Now, she said that there's no doubt there are groups out there trying to keep some Kansans from voting, and they come from both political parties. For example, she pointed to Democratic efforts to vilify the use of provisional ballots. Despite accusations that the use of provisional ballots is an attempt to not count your vote, Lehman says those ballots actually protect you from any mistakes election workers might have made, making your vote more likely to be counted. Meanwhile, she says she's had policymakers admit to her they're trying to keep marginalized groups like African Americans, women, etc., away from the polls. I have not met an election official, and I am very much involved, still am at the national level, at, um, across the country. I have not met a single one who I honestly believed was trying to suppress anyone's vote. I have met many policymakers who have flat out acknowledged to me they are seeking to suppress certain people's votes. Layman says she's also a big fan of mail-in balloting, and despite hearing stories of problems like ballot harvesting, she's never been able to track down a single confirmed case. And here to discuss this and other topics of interest this week, we have not Senator Larry Halley, who was supposed to be with us, but got stuck in Topeka. Instead, we have State Representative Patrick Penn, Republican from Wichita. Thank you so Thank much you so for much jumping in at the last it. minute. Yes, ma'am. And joining us by Zoom, we have Democratic State Representative Ree Shu from Westwood. Thank you both so much. And Ree, I've got you up, so we're going to start with you. What was your takeaway as you listened to this story? Uh, it was a lot of head nodding. It's the same thing that I'm experiencing with uh, in Topeka. I, I think we all know I I'm a big fan of, of tension. My parents were both scientists, push and pull. And elections are always a, a tension between accessibility and safety. Right. And over the last, you know, several years, I, I've only heard that our elections were 100 percent safe and secure um, from election officials all the way up to the secretary of state, Scott Schwab. Um, so I don't see any reason to, to make them any less accessible if they're already safe. Interesting point there. I, Patrick, what about you? What was your takeaway? Absolutely. Uh, I actually worked before getting into politics as an election poll worker, as a supervising judge, received the training and also as a poll worker on, on different elections, some big, some small. And I've only seen nothing but the utmost respect and professionalism, both in the workers at the poll sites, but also in the training. So I have every confidence that our elections are secure uh, and that we actually have a very good system. The things that uh, I also know from my military experience is that the farther you get away from the poll box, the more opportunity that you have, like in Afghanistan or Iraq, for something to intervene and, 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 and mess up the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my biggest thing would be that you want to have transparency, accountability, but also that security and that accessibility as well. And we don't want to give up the one for the other. So I agree uh, that there are things that we can look at. We've looked at it in my short term in the legislature, and I look forward to uh, delving deeper into that if we can improve the situation. Yeah. And certainly you mentioned the Iraq and Afghanistan issues and we saw that in 2020 with the post office mail slowing down some ballots mm -hmm. not able to make it in. Listening to Tabitha's comments does it change your position at all on any of the voting policies that you support? No, no. Uh, I think the, th the things that she was talking about, I've not met any of those policymakers or legislators myself if they do exist. Uh, I would never besmirch anybody's uh, you know conversations that they've had, I would love to uh, have her point out who those p people are, whether it be right, left, or indifferent, because we have sworn to uphold and defend a way of life uh, and to include our ele election system. Uh, and if we have people who are out there trying to uh, go against a free and fair election, be it on the right or the left, uh, that's something that I can't, uh, I, I can't abide that. 
Yeah. What about you, Ree? Has that changed your position on uh, any of the voting uh, rights uh, issues that you support? No, uh, I was not a fan of either of the two bills passed in this legislature, and it sounds like Tabitha also agrees with me. Again, the, these two bills, I believe, make voting less accessible um, and ultimately not any more safe. And, and so uh, I, I think that, in my opinion, is a poor trade-off. I, I voted against both of those. And as we look at this, that tension between safety and accessibility, both of you have said you support that. and believe that the Kansas uh, elections are safe. So as we move forward, is there some way to take what appears to be then the partisanship, the, the political aspect out of future voting legislation? I, I think just addressing that issue kind of more broadly is um, Patrick and I, we, we are pretty different people. We have very different backgrounds. We have very different political beliefs, but we're, we're also good friends. And so a good way to take the partisanship out of it is just to become better friends with, with each other. And so um, he and I have, have actually gotten together quite a few times and just chatted about issues. That's something I've tried to do, um, again, broadly as a member of the Kansas Future Caucus, which is all the legislators under 40, again, by, very bipartisan, and just try to take the heat out a little bit. Let, let's get down to the stuff that we can agree on first. Um, maybe across generational lines, maybe across, you know, um, minority lines, whatever lines that there might be that we agree on, um, and then try to, you know, try to make partisanship the last line of, of battle, so to speak, in politics. Patrick, a lot of head nodding there. I, I How do about... you see taking partisan <laughs> politics out of election voting? I find myself head nodding a lot with Ree because at the end of the day, what we are here to do is to make sure that Kansas works for everyone. Uh, and that's across racial, demographic, gender, whatever the lines are. Uh, there are the things that bind and, and, and call us together as Kansas citizens. So if we can figure out a way for these things that we definitely agree upon and get those things squared away going forward, I think that's the way that legislation should go. When we get around the periphery and the edges, the things that uh, would give us an advantage or whatever the case might be politically, well, that's where we have a little bit of consternation and we can have those battles. But the lion's share, the majority of what I've seen in the State House are people of general goodwill, like uh, Ree, who are coming together trying to get the business and the work of Kansans done. That is always appreciated, not only by myself as a legislator, but also by my constituents. Um, so I think that, you know, while we, like you said, we, we come from different ends of the spectrum. Me personally, I would like to see an election day. That's my experience. That's how I grew up. I would like to see it at the polling site. But that is probably on the extreme and politics is the art of the possible. There's the ebb and flow, the give and take of compromise, like he said, the tension. So the legislation that comes out, while it may not meet everything that I want it to, it's the best compromise that we can find. So I fully support the legislation, my record proves that, and if we can do anything to make it better for Kansans, I'm all on board. All right, and a quick note, Tabitha will be joining us as a panelist next week for our post-election episode. But first, you've got to cast your votes in those local races, races that are becoming more partisan and filled with more mudslinging every week. This Cakes Jackson Overstreet shows us. Less than a week to go before the November 2nd election, but voters are already heading to the polls. But there's a growing problem for many local races this year. Unfortunately, negative politics can drive voter turnout sometimes. That, that it, it can be easier to get people to vote against than vote for. Political science expert Michael Smith talking about several examples in this year's races. From former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo endorsing an Andover school board candidate to local political parties endorsing a whole slate of them. Some of these races, like your local races in Wichita, they're not even supposed to be partisan. But that partisan climate just gets into everything. Smith says it's not just the partisanship, but more arguing as well. A Wichita Firefighters Union calling out Councilmember Jared Sorello on this mailer, claiming he had the organization's endorsement when it had actually endorsed his opponent. So what do voters think about all of this? I have a problem more with the school board section of it. Yeah. They're supposed to be impartial. This is about budgets and stuff, not really about what side of the aisle you're on. Voters we spoke with Thursday say they pay attention when disputes happen with candidates. Some say it can have an influence in certain situations. If I'm leaning towards not quite knowing who I want to vote for, then stuff like this does matter to me personally. But others say they're more focused on the issues each candidate fights for. I'm looking at the big picture of what's going to benefit us, we the people. 
And as we look at this issue, this slide into the muck, shall we say, is there a way to slow it down? I don't know if there's a way to slow it down. I think uh, emotions make excellent foot soldiers, but horrible generals. That has been a mantra of mine for uh, quite some time. And I will tell you what I mean by that. When you have your passions inflamed and inflared uh, by people who are third parties or trolls and social media, uh, I think that a lot of this uh, noise and, and, and the discontent and the discordant that we have uh, can be taken out by people reining in those who support them uh, on the right and the left. I think another piece of it is, is that we have to get back to the point where we are seeing exactly as one of the persons interviewed said, that this is not about the partisanship, it's about the budget. And I know from sitting on the K through 12 education budget that there's a significant amount of money that is going to be pumped into the school board uh, and it will be used and programmed to promote certain policies or agendas that are not necessarily in keeping with the vision and the values of the majority of my constituents. Uh, because of that, those are the types of things that I would like to educate my voters on so that they can go out and make that informed decision. We want them to be informed and involved and I think that's what we're trying to get after. Okay. And Ree, what about you? Do you see a way to slow the slide into the muck? Yeah, I think a big part of it is campaign finance reform. Um, I think, you know, if candidates want to spend their own money on their own mailers, that that's one thing. They, they should do that and follow all the ethics rules. What kind of gets, again, kind of into the muck is all these super PACs. And, and, and we don't know who their donors are. We don't know what their donors' aims are um, starting to influence these local elections um, from school board to city councils to, you know, water board. And, and I, I think that's a real, really big shame. Um, I think some um, of these races actually don't even require a paid for by attribution, or, or at least it, it can be confusing. Um, and then so I think if we look at really extensive campaign finance reform, um, mandatory reporting of donors for, for these PACs, um, I, I think to some extent um, we can make it a little bit more transparent. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to bring up too is that we do know at the State House both sides of the aisle vote together. What is it? More than 90% of the time. <laughs> so really the partisan politics is a minority of the issues that uh, most lawmakers are dealing with, right. but they get the headlines. That's right. part of the reason for this show right. is to kind of illuminate the fact that there's as much agreement as there is disagreement as we've seen already today. And thank you for yeah. bringing that forward below. Yeah. We appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, questions arose Thursday about how the city of Wichita got $4 million to help minority communities fight COVID and who else benefited from the grant with the publication of a Wichita Eagle investigation. How much does truth matter? I, I think it matters a great deal. Chan Swaim says telling the truth was the core principle behind this article in the Wichita Eagle. It's basically a city hall accountability story on whether the city is vetting their applications for for federal money. A weeks long investigation, Swaim says, showed the city of Wichita used nearly year old statewide data on the number of African Americans dying of COVID, making up 30% of deaths in Kansas. But updated numbers specific to the city showed blacks in Wichita accounted for just 7% of COVID deaths here. And then there's whether the city attorney is giving good advice to city council members, whether city council members are playing favorites in the contracts they're awarding. The contract for using that money to get COVID health information to minority communities went to a company run by the best friend of Vice Mayor Brandon Johnson and his wife Danielle. We cannot tell staff to do this or that. Like it, there's a firewall up that's purposeful in order to make sure that electeds aren't influencing contracts. Mayor Brandon Whipple says he understands holding the city accountable and admits council members aren't perfect, but he says there's a worrying element to the Eagles article. However, you know, you're, you're putting pictures of African Americans all over the graphic that they're using. Uh, when the people behind a scene who were given advice, those pictures aren't on there. Uh, news that usually white people are privileged. Especially when he says there's no evidence Johnson got any type of personal kickback from the deal. Dr. Michael Smith, a political analyst from Emporia State University, says stories like this about local government are common, leading to a lack of trust from voters. There's quite a history of sometimes even big city school districts can have these kind of situations. Um, the um, owner of Genesis Health Clubs was well connected to the Brown back administration. It just feeds into that distrust of politics that leads to support for people like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. 
And on Friday, Cake News spoke with Brandon Johnson directly. He told them, quote, I think the community knows me. They know me from the work I've done before I was in office. They know me now. I'm an ethical person, pretty open and transparent. He went on to say this whole thing is disrespectful to the bottom line to make it seem like it's just me. These are elected officials, groups, activist organizations all coming together. And to say that I can tell them what to do and made all of this happen, it's just wrong. And to hear more from Brandon Johnson, check cake.com. They'll have that complete story there. And as we look at this issue, a, Dr. Smith brought up an interesting point about the trust in voter or voters have in the system. And certainly when we, we saw that two years ago with the mayoral race in Wichita, it really hurts the voters confidence in the system when major scandals break. Absolutely, it does. And and while I don't have anything specific to say about this particular investigation, I, I, I don't know anything about it. What I will say in my short time in politics, I have learned that perception is reality. Uh, and when you have a certain perception going about you, whether it be something that is uh, foisted and inflamed unnecessarily, or it may be something that's true, uh, it does a number on the voters trust in their elected officials. Uh, so, you know, the big thing that we have to do as elected officials is be truthful. We have to have integrity. We have to be the same person in public that we are in private and in our dealings. And if we don't have that modicum of respect for ourselves, how can we have it for our voters? I try uh, to uh, instruct my sons to not live in a certain fashion. Uh, because I don't want them to have that question about their integrity. Uh, so when you see things like this happening, uh, there may be more to the story. As you said, there are different sides to it. But I would uh, submit to you that the truth is in there somewhere, and it needs to be found, it needs to be exposed, and the people need to know so that they are informed with their consent on who they choose to give their consent to govern them. A few years ago, you saw that we had this happen here in Wichita politics, and now it seems unfortunately that is more of the same. Yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, questions of transparency, a big issue. And uh, Ree, we were talking before the show that transparency, something you are really supporting. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, I don't know the ins and outs uh, of daily Wichita politics either, but uh, overall, I support transparency. And if there were any sort of ethical considerations or violations, um, absolutely, I fully support any investigation into that. Um, I, I think it's worth taking a, a huge step back and then and seeing, you know, are these malicious mistakes? Are these ignorant mistakes, right? Just just mistakes that people make. I, I think that's worth looking at. And number two, you know, if, if this grant money goes through, what the ultimate impact uh, this grant money can be on the uh, on the community as well. You know, obviously I, I don't want it to be gotten through, you know, ill-conceived gains or, or anything like that. Um, but, you know, if, if the mistakes are rectified, um, if this money does still come through and it can do a, a whole lot of good in the community, you know, ultimately that that's that's ultimately what matters, right? Um, hopefully, these mistakes and if they are mistakes, get get forgotten, and then um, the people's lives are, are improved. And 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 again, I, I'm trying to read this with uh, the rosiest and, and most optimistic look possible um, because I, I just don't know what's going on here. Yeah. Well, and I think this story just breaking on Thursday, a lot of folks still finding out details. I know that Brandon Johnson, when Cake News spoke with him had a very different look from what we got from that newspaper article. I don't want to belabor the point, but I agree with Ree. Uh, transparency is paramount. And I would also tell you that the journey is just important as the destination. So I will gently push back on that, the utilitarian mode of it, that if people's lives are, are benefit, benefited from these funds or however it was come down, that's not the end all be all determinant factor about whether or not someone uh, did it in the right way. And uh, I don't want to wallpaper this as we saw in the segment with the red herring about race and color. And I don't want to push it off to the side about whether or not there's utility uh, for the greater good. Integrity is integrity, and it doesn't care about your skin color, and it doesn't care about what the outcomes are. What it, the people need are people that they can trust. That's who they're entrusting to govern over them. So we need to get to the bottom of these things and let it all shake out. All right, we're going to leave that one there because there are certainly more details on that story that will be coming out, I'm sure, over the next few weeks. Meanwhile, a deadly truck into train crash into a a deadly truck and train crash in Mays this week raised questions about whether accidents like that one could be avoided. As Cakes Eli Higgins shows us, holes in state safety laws are a problem.
It's not uncommon for those tracks to just be blocked like at all times. McKaylin Weingartner lives just down the road from the train versus truck crash Tuesday near 135th and 53rd that killed 36 year old Ana Guerrero Dominguez and injured her two daughters. Here's what we learned Wednesday. Dominguez was traveling north on 135th just like this. The train was headed east in the middle of these three tracks. But as you can see from our Sky 10 News drone, there are two parked trains on the outer two tracks parked so close to the road, you wouldn't be able to see a train coming until it's too late. The question now that's on everyone's mind, is this legal? It's gut-wrenching because our organization has continuously advocated at the state house for safety improvements. Kansas Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Legislative Board Director Ty Dragu says, put simply, Kansas has no laws on how close to a road railroad companies can park or even how long they can block a road completely, something he's been urging lawmakers to fix for years. We have been saying this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and now it's happened. Dragu says at the end of the day, it's like this because railroad companies in Kansas have done a good job lobbying legislators to prevent them from being regulated, but hopes lawmakers will finally listen after such a terrible tragedy. I'm hoping um, the legislators that have been set on the sidelines look at this as now it's time to do something because unfortunately it's too late for this family. It's my hope that they say, we're not going to do this to another family in the future. And Ree, this has been a very deadly and a big story here in this area. Things like this, is this the kind of thing that needs to happen for change to start happening at the state level? Unfortunately, uh, I am not on the relevant committee, so I have not heard th this throughout the last couple of years, but just from the story that, that I'm aware of, it, unfortunately, I, I don't want it to be because of these accidents that, that the right measures are taken. Um, uh, obviously, that's too late. You don't want to, the, the fire to start before you buy a fire alarm, right? Um, and so I, I would have loved to get ahead of this um, ahead of time. Um, and I, I think to some extent, going back to an earlier point, this comes down in part to campaign finance, right? I, I don't take corporate money. And so like I, I have not met with railroad companies who are super interested in, in this particular type of legislation or lack of safety regulations. I, I'm interested in what's best for the people and what's best for the workers. Um, and, and then I, I think campaign finance is, you know, maybe t part of the equation here, right? Part of the reason why we haven't seen this type of legislation move. Um, I don't know uh, why leadership or legislative leadership has not moved on this issue, um, but certainly it would have been nice to avoid this. Yeah. What about you, Patrick? Does it feel like it's time for a change? Well, uh, first I, I would say that uh, my family and, and all the legislature, our hearts and prayers go out to Ms. Guerrero uh, Dominguez as well in, in the loss of her to her family. Uh, it's tragic. It is beyond tragic and I agree with Ree. Unfortunately, I don't think that it takes something like this for us to examine fully uh, uh, legislation that would prevent it. Uh, again, I'm not on the relevant committees myself, uh, but I would definitely be uh, in favor of getting together with anyone who is willing to save life, especially something uh, that can be easily fixed with a piece of legislation on a bipartisan fashion. Bring all, all voices to the table. Let's get this thing to, hammered out in a way that saves Kansans' lives, because if we aren't doing this for the people, I don't understand what we're doing it for. All right. Well, we do have one other thing to talk about, and it's been a big deal. The fate of a state law that requires district courts to make a ruling within 10 days when someone sues over a county's COVID-19 restrictions. It's now in the hands of the Kansas Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court heard arguments from attorneys Tuesday on a law requiring district courts to rule within 10 days when someone sues over a county COVID restriction. Three of the seven justices expressed skepticism the law is constitutional. A Johnson County judge had earlier ruled it unconstitutional, saying it was unenforceable and robbed counties of their right to due process. But Supreme Court justices first must decide whether the case should have been dead before it even reached them. Then they can decide if the law applying to county COVID-19 restrictions violates the Kansas Constitution. If it says yes to the first question, district courts still will have to rule quickly on lawsuits against counties. And we, of course, have to wait for the Supreme Court to make its ruling. It has not happened yet. But this entire fight has been going on ever since last spring, legal fight over this law. 
does that lead to perhaps more changes to the state's Emergency Management Act uh, as we go into the next session, or is it the point where lawmakers are saying we're done with it? Well, again, that's something that we have to get in touch with our legislative leadership uh, to understand exactly where the body is. Mm -hmm. Are they done on the right or the left within the caucuses? What I would say is that what has been my experience, you go up there thinking that you're going to take a, a, a a bulldozer to an issue and change the world, get a piece of legislation passed, but really what you need is a chisel uh, because things can be done, but they can be improved upon. So SB 40 is a bill that we've passed, I fully support. Uh, my record shows that and, and what I think that one of the things is we see other challenges come up and if there are other issues that are raised uh, from, the, from, the, from the public or from the courts, we can go back and change some of those things and, and, and make sure that it's uh, more fully uh, applicable, uh, but I don't, I don't think that the, the, the premise of the bill gets away from what we are trying to do, uh, my caucus, which is to put this power back in the hands of the people and push back against uh, totalitarianism from a governor. Okay. And Re, what about you? Do you see more changes coming or are lawmakers kind of done with this issue? It depends on what the Supreme Court rules, right? And and I, I like Patrick's uh, analogy with the chisel because that's him in the majority party, right? Like I'm in the minority party. It feels like I'm trying to try to chip off a rock with a pen or something most of the time. Um, <laughs> but obviously, I've, I've talked about uh, tension um, earlier in this show, and I think this is another good example of it, right? If you're looking at emergency management laws, there's this tension between um, in individual freedom and rights and having really simple and clear guardrails, right? to protect individual rights, but also giving state and local governments um, the right amount of authority and flexibility to deal with actual emergencies, not just COVID. Um, this, this was meant to be kind of a, a, an overall rehaul of um, the emergency management system, which I think was um, due for an update. And so I'm always willing to, to, to um, look at improving things. Um, I, I did not think that SB 40 was a perfect bill when I voted for it. I, I doubt anybody did. It was a pretty severe compromise for everybody on a, a lot of levels. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it, it could have been much, much worse. The, the, the first versions of this bill were, were much, much mm -hmm. worse than what ended up getting voted on. And okay. then, um, and we got there. <laughs> All right, and Rhi, I hate to interrupt you, but we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both, Rhi and Patrick, for joining us this week. I'd also like to thank our news partners at the Wichita Eagle, KSN News, and Cake News for sharing their materials with us. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. We'd love to continue it online. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or PBS Kansas. Thank you, and have a great week.